Support for the Dice Tower comes from listeners like you, and from The Op, also known as USAopoly, and from GameNerds.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 720. Gimme a gimmick. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, Tom and I have played games with each other. Jeff plays games with monkeys, and our listeners have been playing games incorrectly this whole time. Finally, we draw you to the table with our top 10 gimmicks in games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Bob Costas of board gaming, Tom Vassell. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell. Hey there, I'm Eric Summer. Welcome to the Dice Tower, and um, yeah, I don't really got any kind of clever thing to say at this point in time, other than <laughs> uh, school is coming back, yeah, 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 I don't know why, I was, I stopped by the store with my daughter today to pick up some food, and I saw the school supplies, and I said, doesn't that bring a warm feeling to your heart? Wow, yeah. She, wow. she was not impressed. <laughs> No, no, my kids don't want to hear about school, although they were looking at like the, the last couple of weeks of camp and we have a family vacation coming up. And so it, it is obvious that things are moving towards school starting, but we don't start till uh, the first week of September. So we have a little bit of time left. I keep forgetting that that's how that I mean, that's the way it was when I was a kid. I just down here school start earlier. But yeah, it's it's weird how different sections of the country have different schedules entirely. Um so I guess I don't know whether that's good or bad. I guess it feels like we get a summer, but then we tend to go later into June uh, than, than other areas of the country. I don't know why we're talking about school. We're not even we don't even have a school game. There's no transition here. Um, <laughs> well, we can talk about a, a quick celebration. Uh, yesterday, I, I got to celebrate the 100th episode of Dice Tower Tonight, uh, which was a show that I started with you, Tom, back in 2017. That's right. Although, just to be clear, folks, it wasn't yesterday. It's yesterday as of us recording this. It's right. almost a week old, actually. But you can find it on the Dice Tower YouTube channel. You very much can. We played a lot of games with the chat. It was a good time. Uh, and I think it's f- still fun if you go in and check it out, not live. Yeah, I'm seeing all over the internet. There's a lot of advertising. You know, a lot of these uh, folks are, there's a lot of celebrations of 10-year anniversaries going on right now. Hmm. I did my first review in uh, 2002, so... Oh, boy. You're going to have a 20 coming up? I don't know if it's, like, technically a 20, but maybe we'll do it. 20 years of the Dice Tower. <laughs> oh, boy. Were you, you weren't even called the Dice Tower then, no, right? No, I think the Dice Tower the Dice Tower as an exact thing started in 2005. Yeah. So I missed my 15th anniversary. Oh, well, you were busy. <laughs> yes. Um, well, anyway, folks, lots of things going on. So d- as Eric pointed out, we do have a video channel if you listen to this. And if you don't have time to watch the video channel, which I suspect many people who listen to this uh, show do not, you can always look at DicetowerAudio.com. That's just like a podcast that plays the audio of many of the videos we have on our channel. Hmm. With that being said, I would invite you to the Dice Tower Retreats, but they're sold out. The Dice Tower Cruise, I'd like to tell you about that, but that's almost sold out. Not quite, but it's getting close. And Dice Tower West, folks, stay tuned on our channel. Uh, The the first week of August, we'll be making an announcement about the where's, why's, and how's of Dice Tower West. And registration for that will open first week of September. All this is not that far away. Yes, I'm already Mar- time marches ever forward. I'm already planning the autumn spectacular. Oh. But the good thing about the summer spectacular is for the first time in one and a half years, Eric and I were able to play games together. I don't even know if we played a game together at Dice Tower West. Did we? Uh, uh, it was very small and brief if that was the case. I don't think we did. I think we went and did our own separate things at Dice Tower West. I think this is the most games we've ever played together. 
It, we were we were quite active. Got to play a lot of stuff. Um, try out a lot of new games. I loved being in such close proximity with the library and getting to see the office and and just hang out with people and and play games with adults uh, for for the first time in a while. Um, at least in in any sort of like intense capacity. I've done a couple of game nights, but. You know, this was sort of like a mini con for me. I got to play several games in a day and then come back and do it again the next day. And I hadn't done that in a long time. Sure. When we turned the cameras off, we were still playing games. So, uh, yes. So speaking of that, I'm just going to let Eric run the game time here. And I played three of the games with Eric. So we'll talk about them together. Oh, well, let's let's start with one that Tom slapped down on the table and said, I've been waiting for this to arrive. I want to play this game. That's, the that's game is true. Called, it came in, the, it is it very came in true. the mail. I opened it up and I said, let's play it. We're playing this. Uh, this is called Meadow. Uh, this is published by Rebel Studio. The designer is Clemens Kaliki. Uh, he did Dream Home, right. uh, which was also from Rebel Studio. Uh and uh, this is a it's a set drafting game, a card drafting game in which you are creating a tableau of various scenes of nature. Um, all of the cards have nice little watercolor paintings and uh, you know nature scenes. Um, but there's a lot of unique aspects to this game. Uh, one is the way that you draw the cards, you draft the cards. Most of these cards are in a grid, um, and you can, for your turn, uh, place one of your action tokens on the edges of this grid, and all of your action tokens have numbers on them. So if I place the three in a particular side of the grid, I'm going three uh, spaces along the the grid of cards and taking that particular card into my hand. Um, I'm also getting to place one of the cards when I do this particular action. And uh, I'm placing them on my, my tableau in front of me, but there's often requirements for how these have to be placed down. You have to start with maybe a um, a, a type of terrain, uh, and then an insect might need a particular type of terrain, so I have to play that on top of that terrain, and then a bird might eat that insect, so I can play the bird on top of the insect, and they all have little icons that represent these. But often, when, say, the bird eats the insect, there will no longer be an insect icon on that bird card. Sometimes when the insect, uh, you know, does something, the insect only takes up a small amount of, of that biome, and so many of those icons will still appear on the insect card. It, it's very thematic in a very subtle way. Uh, for example, you can build a, a mailbox on a house card, because the, the, the cards get more complex as you get to apex predators and buildings and features and stuff. So there's a house card, and you can put a mailbox on it or next to it, but that that card will still have a symbol for a house because the mailbox doesn't replace the house, it just adds to the house. Little stuff like that is very interesting as you build out these sort of columns and try and set up your your card combos. Um, The other thing you can do instead of grabbing cards from that grid is you can go to the other side of the table where there's this campfire board and you, your action tokens that have those numbers on them also have a reverse side with special powers on them, like play two cards or draft multiple cards from the board, but you don't get to play any. Um, And so you have to choose how you're going to use your tokens. Do I use them to draft using the number four, or do I use them to play two cards uh, on the other board? You're you're trying to get combinations of symbols to score points and, and bring out more and more different creatures. The more complex they are, the more points they will be worth at the end of the game. There's also landscape cards that you can bring out. And then once you've got those out, you can find objects in them and develop them. And lots of opportunities to score points as you add to your tableau. But there's a lot of really neat, brain-bendy, subtle aspects of this game that I really enjoyed. And so uh, I'm looking forward to my next play of Meadow. I really, really like Metal. I've played it quite a bit since that play I did with Eric. And it's, there's one problem I have with the game is that I think the four player game is a bit too long. Okay. It has eight rounds, and I think six would be much better. And I think the only reason it has eight rounds is so that every player has a chance to go first twice. Yeah, that probably makes sense. And and also there's like a halfway point in the game where Right, that's why I'm saying you six, bring up so more three and three. complicated cards. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you enough time hopefully to get it those definitely cards does. that you're hoping for. You can for. get those out. Yeah. Uh the game kind of isn't a huge build up of a game. It's it's more of a casual build up, but 
man, I love the theme. I love the artwork. The theme just yeah. really works in this game. And it just feels, this feels like for some people, it could be game of the year material. That's how strongly mm. I feel about this game. You know, we I could see we that. have all these games that get the big buzz, right? There's the the big Kickstarter. We're about, we're about to talk about one. You know, the miniatures. Yeah. There's the Euro game that's the darling of everybody, the heavy Euro game, and then, you know, the, the huge Kickstarter. This is that one from an established publisher that's that I think I it's a weird time for it to be published. Otherwise I could see this one being nominated for the Kenner spiel actually. Hmm. Um, and it still might be, you know, who knows? Uh, but I could see, I could see this showing up in people's top 10 of the year lists at the end of the year. I think it's that strong of a game. It's not overly complicated, but it's also not just paper thin. And every time, I mean, I can't tell you times we play the game and I'll say, this card goes on top of this card. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, so I love metal. Yeah. Um, so very much, uh, this one went straight into the Dice Tower Library. Excellent game. Excellent. Uh, next up is that large Kickstarter release that Tom talked about. This is Wonderland's War. Uh, this is a game from Druid City and Skybound Entertainment. It's designed by Tim Eisner, Ben Eisner, and Ian Moss. Uh, it is a, as you might guess, a um, Alice in Wonderland-themed game. It is a area control and action drafting game. The game sort of split into two sections, two halves of each round that you're going to play. The first round is that action drafting. You've got the, the tea party, the, the table at the tea party, and each of the seats at the tea party has little actions, um, cards that get placed around the board. And you're going to take your leader character and move them uh, as many spaces as you want around the board and take that card in action. So by taking a card, you might get to place some of your minions around the board for the second half of the round. Uh, you might get to draft more characters into your bag, which is also for the second half of the round. Um, just a bunch of cool actions. But you can't pass the first, the start space of the uh, of the the table without risking some nasty stuff to happen. You have to roll a die and get some shards, which are worth negative points if you have too many of them. So you don't want to go too far, but if there's a really juicy card, you, you might want to jump ahead of the other players and try and grab it. So this continues until everybody has drafted four cards, possibly passing that start space one or more times. Uh, and then you move on to the second half of the round in which you look at the areas that you have placed your minions out on the board. You also get to place your hero pieces. So if you have Alice or the Queen of Hearts or the Mad Hatter, they get to go out onto the board wherever you want to put them. And then you have this sort of area control battle. And it's not just simply area control. It's also a bag building game. Uh, you will have been drafting character chips and you've got your own normal chips into your bag and you're going to start pulling chips. Um, very Quacks of Quedlinburg style where you pull one and you all reveal. Um, and those who are in the battle are trying to gain battle power and triggering abilities of all these chips that they've drafted. Uh, but every time they get a nasty chip, one of the bad chips, they have to remove one of their characters on the board. So every time, you know, depending on how strong your presence is in a zone, you can hang on to the battle a little longer and hopefully hold out longer than your opponents. You won't be able to do that in every zone, but you might be able to do it in a few. Uh, and then you score points if you manage to last the, the longest or have the most battle power at the end of a, of a round in a zone. You're going to score points for that zone. You're going to gain castle pieces that make it easier to do so in the future um, and, and trigger all sorts of abilities. There's lots of stuff. There's a lot of asymmetric powers, upgrades you can do for your characters, um, and all that, the, the chips that you can add to your bag and remove other chips. Uh, lots of cool stuff, mechanisms going on here. I like Wonderland's War. I don't know how much I want to seek out more plays of it. I don't think I'm hunting down a copy of this. It's not totally my style of game. Um, I, I mentioned the, the similarity to Quacks of Quedlinburg. That is, it has a lot of the same buttons, but this is probably twice as long as Quacks. Um, and I think I prefer that game to be a little quicker. And if you have really bad pulls... If you're just pulling the nasty chips and not getting those really powerful ones that you've been dying to pull out of your bag, then you're you're going to lose some major battles at the wrong time. And like I said, I'd much rather that happen in a shorter game than in a longer game like this one. 
Still, the version we played is deliciously produced, probably overproduced. Uh, the chips are wonderful. Yes. Um, if you do seek out this game, I would recommend going for the upgrade kit that at least gets you the better chips because they're really nice. Um, there are also miniatures in the full deluxe version. You don't necessarily need those. Um, you could. I would. I would be happy with standees or something along those lines. But the chips are really nice in the deluxe version. Um, but I like it. I think it's worth a play. It's worth checking out. Certainly look for it in the Dice Tower library if you're coming to one of the events. Um, but I, I'm not going to seek Wonderland's War out. I think it's just a little too long for my taste. I don't know where I'm sitting on this one. I don't hmm. know. Well, I liked it. And I liked it better the second time we played than I did the first time. There okay. are some issues it's bigger than it needs to be. It's slightly longer than it needs to be. And it feels like it has one more mechanism than it needs to have. Hmm. Oh, you, you said bigger. I mean, it barely fits on the table. Sure. Even with a large gaming style table, this is a table hog. It almost needs, the, the board could have been maybe two thirds the size, I think. Yeah. But if you have one of those, you know, small banquet tables, I don't see how you would even fit this on that. Especially not with five players. Um, so, I don't know, though. I love the theme. I really, really, really like the move around the board aspect. Uh, yeah, the, the early, the, the card drafting part. Um, I, like, I like pulling chits from a bag. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, let me okay. really phrase this. I like the game. I don't know yeah. how much I like it. It's one that needs more thought than normal. And you know what? I'm having very similar thoughts that I had these exact same thoughts about the last game that they did. Hmm. So, yeah. I don't know. It's a cool idea. The Wonderland's War. There's a lot going on. It feels that the sides feel asymmetrical for sure. So, eh, well, we'll have to see. Okay. So we just talked about playing a, uh, a bag-building game, a pool-building game. Uh, I have another one of those. This is a racing game from AEG. It's called Cubitos. Uh, designer is John D. Clare, who also designed Space Base. Is that how you say it? I thought it was Cubitos, but, you know, again, I don't know. It's a made-up word. I don't know. There was no pronunciation guide. Um, Cubitos, Cubitos, Cubitos. I don't know. I'm thinking Cubitos. Like, they're toes that are cube-like because they're running. Anyway. That um, is a total made-up thing. <laughs> is, it's a race game uh, where you're trying to take your little blocky racing character and move them around uh, a race board. Um, there's, there's lots of different layouts you can go with. Um, and the board has um, sort of a the quick route. In fact, they put a, like a little trough. Uh, down that particular fastest route. Uh, but then if you travel farther away from the beaten path, there are rewards that you can tag around the, uh, the course of the board. And whoever gets to the end first is going to win the game. Now, the way you propel your character around is through dice building mechanisms. Uh, you have a whole mess of dice, and you start out with very, very simple dice that have, uh, I think, symbols on just one or two of the faces of them. Uh, and, and you will be eventually acquiring better dice. Uh, and this is one of those sort of like Quacks of Quedlinburg or, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to think of Marvel, uh, the, the Marvel Dice Masters game or, um, or Quarriers, where you have the same dice, but there are multiple powers for those dice uh, that you will decide to go with at the beginning of every game. So you've got a bunch of dice with a bunch of powers and different symbols on their faces. Uh, and you start out with your pool of basic gray, boring dice. Uh, and you'll take that mess of them. Uh, you, you have a hand limit. At the beginning of the game, it's nine dice, and it can grow as the game goes. So you take nine dice, and you, you roll them all. And whatever you get symbols of, you put into your sort of play area. Uh, and as long as you have less than three symbols, you can keep rolling your, your dice that didn't do anything for you. Uh, but once you have three symbols, you may continue going, but you risk busting. So at any point, if you already have three usable faces on your dice or more, 
and you roll and you get no additional faces. You get blanks on all the dice you roll. You've busted. You're not going to get anything this round, except you get to put your, your little character around a little mini fan track that gets you bonuses, sort of a consolation prize for the round. But if you didn't bust, you decide to stop, you get to trigger all of your, your little die faces. Some of those are footprint symbols that you can use to move around the board, and others are money that you can use to buy more dice. All of the dice that you used go into this sort of discard pile. You don't get to touch those for a little while until you need to draw more dice and you don't have any. And then you can take your discard pile and put them into your draw pile. Um, all the dice that were blank from the previous round stay in your hand for the next round. So you'll only be adding another, say, four or five dice from your draw pile into your hand, and then you roll those and you start the next round, etc. Uh, it's this very specific cycling of the dice from zone to zone uh, that does allow you to choose the dice you're going to roll in a particular round, but you sort of have to use all of your dice in your pool before you can bring new dice back around. There are abilities that, of course, can change that. Um, this sounds very mechanical, and it is very mechanical. You have to be very specific about where you're putting your dice and rolling them and, and where they end up, but those offer some really cool decisions. And then you've got the racetrack where you're zooming around and trying to stay ahead of the other players and grab, you know, maybe maybe stray a little bit from the path and grab some cool bonuses that are very useful, like getting rid of those terrible dice in your, your pool or, or getting to uh, move along that fan track without busting. I really like this game. I really, really, really like this game. I immediately ran out and found a copy, um, and I'm dying to play it with the kids. We haven't had a chance to do so yet, but I... I I will probably talk about it on Dice Tower tonight when we get a chance to play it with the kids. Because I, I think that they'll like it. I think my wife will like it. This has... I, I mentioned Quacks a couple times in uh, Wonderland's War. I think Quacks of Quedlinburg, this this hits a lot of the same notes for that. Although this is a race game, whereas Quacks is, is sort of different uh, in that regard. But it has that same pool building excitement of trying to get the combinations you're going for. But you have almost a little more control over what goes into your pool of rolling. There's no nasty dice in, in this game. Uh, it's just a matter of whether the symbols you're looking for come up and whether you get a zero on a particular roll. Um, I love all, there's tons of cards and abilities for the different dice, and there's layouts of the track, and there's just a lot to explore here, um, and it's a lot of fun. I really like it. No matter how you pronounce it, QB Toes gets a huge thumbs up from me. All right, I'm going to throw some water on Eric here for a brief Go moment for it. in time. And, I, and I, let me tell you, though, this is an interesting one for me. I gave this, um, I just looked up my rating. I gave it an eight. Okay. That's respectable. I may drop it to a seven. It is slowly waning for me. So mm. um, th there, there's a couple reasons why. Me and Eric already had this discussion. Um, well, first of all, Eric didn't have to deal with the, the terrible boxes in the game. I took your advice. I immediately ditched those boxes. Did they, you try so to so build one, though, to prove me wrong? I feel like I, you would have. I fiddled with it just a little bit. I didn't. I, I trusted you on this one. So it comes with these cube, cubic boxes. Um, that are supposed to hold the dice, although they're way too big for just holding that small amount of dice. Um, and then you're supposed to take the dice out of this cardboard box, and the box has a recessed lid that the dice then have to sit in, but some of the sets of dice have more dice than can fit in that recessed lid, and so they fall out, and, and then eventually you're, like, bending the cardboard. I think it's so that all of the cardboard fits in the box very tightly. Is that the case, if you have them assembled that way? It sort of creates a lower level of the, of the box. But I'm just following Tom's advice and, and getting plastic containers and... And just using those. Okay, well, that's that. That's kind of minor, anyway. It does. That's just a sure. piece, right? My concern for the game is, I'm noticing the more I've played it, it's difficult to catch a runaway leader in the game. By difficult, it's almost impossible sometimes. Hmm. There is a catch-up mechanism. I didn't mention that. There's like little red lines around the board, and the number you are away from the leader, you get to use more dice on that particular turn. Yes, but that's not really a catch-up mechanism. It just gives you a couple extra dice, which you could still easily bust. You know, the, 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 the biggest problem for me with this game, and I found this out as I keep playing games of it, 
is I, I'll, I take all these cards and I'm like, all right, I'm going to pick the cards for this game. I'm going through and go, nah, that's not interesting. Nah, that's not interesting. <laughs> There's a lot of cards I don't find interesting. This is hmm. the very opposite of games like Dominion, where I think every card is interesting except maybe two. Okay. And uh, there's 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 a lot of cards that are interesting for the same color die, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna wait to see Eric come back from his kids with this one because I don't think this game is as intuitive as you think it is. Hmm. I think that whole cycling thing, if it was a bag, if you threw the dice in a bag and pulled them from a bag, that'd be simple. But moving around in your board, you're going to – and when you bust, you get to put the dice back. But you don't, you keep dice in your hand. And it's – I'm finding that every time I teach it, I'm like, this is a pain in the neck to teach. Hmm. You played with three top-of-the-line gamers. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. I'm serious. I'm serious. There's a difference there. Um so we'll see. We'll see. Maybe I'll come around on this. Maybe they'll release some more cards for the dice. Okay. Um, but I'm wondering. This is a game I love the concept of a ton. Yeah. It's just All not right. feeling like a race to me currently. I don't know that I've played a game yet where the person who wasn't in the lead, say two-thirds of the race, didn't win. I. I mean, I had rounds where it looked like I was way ahead and my opponents caught up uh, and, then and, and almost pulled it. Well, it, it was a tie. We actually did the tiebreaker rules where we both crossed the finish line at the same time and I managed to pull ahead on the next turn just barely. All right. Well, let's revisit this after you play it with the kids. And we'll see what happens. All right. All right. The last game Eric's talking about, I did not play, so I'll just shut up now. All right. Well, maybe I can convince you. Uh, the game is I doubt it. <laughs> it's called Subastral. Uh, this is uh, one of the latest from Ben Pinchback and Matt Riddle. Uh, it has art by Beth Sobel, a lot of landscape art in this game, and it's from Renegade Games. Uh, Subastral is, it. if you look at the cover of this, it looks like it's a sci-fi space game, but the name Subastral is below the stars, which means that it's it's about biomes on Earth. Um, this is a, it's a card game where you are drafting these cards that represent different biomes. Uh, there is eight different biomes. There's like tundra and there's conifer forest and, and stuff like that. Um, the cards have numbers one through six on them, which don't necessarily mean anything for scoring. They're, they're much more for, uh, for the positioning in how they're placed out on the board. You will have a hand of cards and you're trying to build a tableau of cards. The way you draft them and the way the cards come out is that there are six clouds in the center of the table and cards will come out onto these clouds. So there might just be one on a cloud or there might be three or even four on a cloud. Uh, And you on your turn will choose to to play a card from your hand and then that number is important. So if I have a three card, I can play it on the three cloud. Uh, And then I can decide to either go to the left, to the two and the one columns, or to the right, to the four, five, six columns. If I go to the left, I get to take the cards into my hand. So I can take all the cards that are on the two cloud or the one cloud. Those go in my hand. And that's the mechanism for keeping my hand healthy. Uh, Because you don't want to run out of cards in this game. You basically have to just draw a card and lose your turn if you do that. That's not good. That's not efficient. So I can go left get cards into my hand, or I can go right and put all those cards into my tableau. And as I build this tableau, I'm putting the like biomes together, but the order that I'm building these matters. So uh, as soon as I, if I say put the tundra first and then the the arctic on the next one, um, and then I get a whole bunch of arctic cards and zero tundra cards, I... I have built like nothing in my first column and a whole bunch of cards in my second column. And that's important because at the end of the game, once we've reached the end of the deck, there's sort of a, here's the last card card. Then uh, we get points for having long strings of like uh, tundras or or biomes. Uh, And also we get lots of points if we've built evenly, um, starting from that first biome. So like I said, if I have three of the the first biome um, and then a huge gap before I get to like the third or the fourth column that has a whole bunch, another three or four cards in it, I'm not going to score for that second and third card because I didn't 
I didn't build enough of my second column. I have to sort of build them all equally if I can, if I want to earn the points. Um, and, and then you total up and see who wins. Um, the, the real joy in this game is that cool drafting. Uh, how do I keep my options open when an opportunity comes up to grab a cool stack of cards or get that biome that I'm missing out of my eight into my, my tableau? Um, I want to have a card that I can grab it uh, with the, the numbers that I have in my hand. So keeping that economy healthy in your hand is the trick. Um, I did not try this with two players, but I did speak with one of my fellow players who did. Uh, he thought that it was much better with more players than just two, because when you have just a couple players, uh, the swings can get a little nastier, as as sometimes the the columns get really long, um, and one player may be able to capitalize that, on that more often than others. With multiple players, that sort of evens out a little bit, but it, with just two, it was too easy for one player to sort of get, always get those really good uh, draws coming out on the board. Still, I liked it for a quick card game, an interesting twist on drafting, uh, makes your head twist just a little bit. The scoring is a little tough to explain, as I tried to do here. Um, it, it's just tricky. You almost have to see it laid out to understand what I'm saying. But yeah, you want to build all of the biomes and you want to build a lot of some biomes. And the farther out uh, in your columns you build those lot of biomes, like if my seventh column has five cards in it, I'm going to get a lot of points. So do that in Subastral from Renegade. Yeah, maybe. It's, Subastral is one of those games that might be good, and indeed it has a good pedigree. It's just that these companies that make a big game and then there's always like a small game. It's like, it's like the big game, kind of. It's in the same stuff. <laughs> you know, the same universe. of the, Well, I mean, this is like real life universe, but it's kind of like our bigger game. And I'm always very suspicious of those games because they're, they're often kind of thrown together. This is related to a larger game that they did, isn't it? I haven't played that one. I think so, which is why I'm 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 cautious because I played the Search for Planet X, and at the same time they made a little card game, which I forget what it was called, and mm. I played that, and I was like, well, this is that's can I go back and play Search for Planet X, <laughs> you know? So, but I mean, hey, I was about to say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw water on you, but I I, I did. You uh, did earlier, but you, well, you don't have different. justification. Well, for Well, again, so. I want to be go- going back to Cupidos. I'm not saying the game's bad at all. I'm still saying it's good. I'm just I'm. I'm not as loving it as much. That's all. Okay. Well, you should give this one a try. It it goes by real fast. This is a nice, uh, you know, filler weight uh, game to to try out. All righty. Let's listen to Jeff. Three, two, one, go. It's time for Game Tech with Jeff Engelstein where we find out how games really work. I always find it fascinating when games are used to explore the way the brain works and the biases that we all have. I find it even more fascinating when those games are taught to animals. In this game tech, I'd like to take a quick look at two studies, both of which involve teaching games to monkeys. Now in the first, researchers at the University of Rochester taught monkeys to play rock, paper, scissors. However, they didn't have them make the hand gestures. Instead, they trained them to stare at a specific spot on a computer screen to select their chosen symbol. The computer then chose for themselves, and if the monkeys won, they got some fruit juice. A loss? No juice. Two male monkeys participated in the study, referred to as Monkey E and Monkey F. First, they had them play against a computer that selected randomly for each game. After many plays, both monkeys ended up with very similar strategies. They both had a dominant pick with a second that was picked occasionally. For monkey E, it was 53% paper and 39% scissors, and monkey F chose 71% scissors and paper 24% of the time. Now, weirdly, neither monkey liked to pick rock. 8% for monkey E and 5% for F. Now, since the computer was playing randomly, any strategy that the monkey picked would do just as well as any other. It's interesting that they both ended up in a similar space with a similar style of strategy. It seems that they basically stuck with their main pick, but if they lost a few times in a row, switched to their second favorite for a few rounds. Now, once the monkeys were pretty set in their styles, which took a couple of days, the researchers mixed things up a bit. They changed the algorithms to tend to take advantage of the monkey's playstyle. 
It started to play more rock against monkey F, who liked scissors, and more scissors against monkey E, who liked paper. What would they do? Well, over the course of the next few days of playing the game, they adjusted. Monkey E was much quicker, adjusting his play style over the course of 100 games. Monkey F took much longer, over 400 games to adjust, but he got there eventually. You actually start to feel for Monkey F as you read this research paper. He was consistently slower to react to all of the different algorithm changes that they threw at the monkeys. However, he did eventually get to a similar performance as that smarty pants Monkey E. Now, the second study was also done at the University of Rochester, but this time the monkeys were trying to predict the result of a coin flip. And again, by looking at specific spots on a computer screen to make their selection. The researchers wanted to see if monkeys were subject to the same fallacy we see in humans, the hot hand idea or the gambler's fallacy. We are really bad at separating past performance from future predictions for items that are not related. The best example, which I have talked about in game text before, is roulette. Now, in roulette casinos, if you've been there recently, the casinos have large displays at roulette tables that show the results of the past 100 or so spins. A ton of stats are shown, like what percentage were red or black, specific numbers, first third, last third, whatever. But of course, all of this information is useless. It does not help you win in any way, shape, or form. Each time the wheel is spun, it's completely independent from all of that stuff that came before. Well, it turns out that monkeys gamble like humans. The monkeys were all way, way more likely to select whichever result won last time. If heads won, the next time they were much more likely to pick heads. If tails won, they picked tails. Now, regardless of what the monkeys did, what strategy they chose, they would get the same number of rewards because it was a true random coin flip. They could just pick heads over and over and over again and do just as well. So this idea of copying what happened last time must be in some sense hardwired into at least primate brains. And in a way, I guess that makes sense. Much of what we encounter in the real world is correlated. It is not just disassociated and random. If you get attacked by a jaguar in one spot or by doing a certain behavior, like jumping up and down loudly on the ground when you're by yourself, it's a pretty decent chance that if you do that behavior again or go to that place again, you'll get the same result. Lightning is actually way more likely to strike the same place twice. Now, this study also links nicely with the rock, paper, scissors study. The monkeys' responses in that one tended to come in clusters. If they picked paper in one game, they were much more likely to pick paper again in the next, particularly if they won. However, we, as humans, have an edge over monkeys. We have the capacity to understand which events truly are random and which are correlated and make decisions appropriately. Unfortunately, many of us don't make use of that faculty, but... Even Monkey F came around eventually, so perhaps there's hope for humanity as well. This is Jeff Engelstein with Game Tech. I would like a t-shirt that says, Even Monkey F came around eventually. I don't know, it sounds like, if I saw you wearing that shirt, Eric, I would think, does that mean something inappropriate? <laughs> I just would I think that. I would think, <laughs> what does he mean by that? Yeah, you're right. Well, I, I meant exactly what I said. Anyway, it would be a very, very inside joke. Support for the Dice Tower comes from The Op, which is a great source for party games. They've got a wonderful collection of games that can bring any group together. From the well-known party game Telestrations, which is the telephone game sketched out, Telestrations After Dark, which is the adult version, to favorites like Blank Slate, Tapple, and you can't forget the party game of the year winner from the Dice Tower Awards, Hues and Cues. The Op has a game for every type of gamer and occasion. Grab a copy for your next summer gathering. You'll be sure to laugh the night away. Available now at theop.games or your local game store today. And an exclusive for Dice Tower listeners, 10% off your entire purchase at theop.games. It's available for all games, puzzles, and accessories. Free shipping available on purchases of $49 or more. This is available for U.S. residents only. All you have to do is enter the code DICETOWER, all one word, at checkout at theop.games. Questions. 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 Our first question is from Robert. Our first question after the bathroom question, anyway. Um, <laughs> Robert says he was uh, playing a game and he was watching a playthrough of Indonesia, and the merging of companies aspect seems so unique. 
Um, if it's not totally unique. There's, it's been done in other games. But anyway, okay. he says, uh, if a designer created a mechanism that was particular of it, could they patent it and cause nobody else to use it in a game? <sighs> Some have tried, if I'm not mistaken. Well, but the answer to that is pretty simple. If you have the money of Wizards of the Coasts, sure. you can scare off people, but the courts have ruled that you can't patent mechanisms of games. Yeah. Oh, but the, the other question, which I've, I want to talk about here, is he said, Robert says, let's say you played a game 30 times, a small, quick game like Santorini, and you find out you were playing a rule incorrectly. Huh. I'm just, this is like the most fantastical thing I could hear of. I don't know how this would happen, but yes. It seems weird to me. But he says it would be personal, but what are your stances on those previous plays not having happened because of the correct play <laughs> and therefore the person never having truly played the game. So for example, he said in Santorini, he watched a play through Santorini and they never put a cap on another level beside the top and he was playing you cap any level beside the ground. Oh, Which okay. would change the that, game tremendously. Very much would. Like yeah. to a point where you wouldn't even, it, it, it just, it's not the same game at all. Like this isn't right. a minor very obviously could be missed in the rule book thing that any person could do. Hmm. This is a, a clear erroneous yeah, rule. Right. That's, that's kind of where I'm leaning with this. That, anyway, that is where you're saying, yeah. So he says, uh, okay, so, so, well, first of all, I don't know that it matters. Like, no, <laughs> like if you come in, like I played the game 30 times, you did not, sir. I, I'm going back on board game geek and I'm deleting all my logged plays. But I, I know what he's. Count. I know what he's asking. Like, did did you really play the game if you played a major rule wrong? How's that? Well, okay. I mean, yes, you played the game, but I would endeavor to play it by the correct rules from there on forward, right? I think that's what any person should do if it's actually correct, and then they, you, you, I would, I would verify it for sure. Sure. I think if you if you played it ninety percent correct, you at least can say you enjoyed that ninety percent. Actually, that does sound like a god power. Like you can cap buildings at any level. Hmm. It might be. Maybe. And maybe. It, maybe it's just a variant. But yeah. There you go. Then he says, "What's the most difficult game?" Th oh. Th this is their opinion. Obviously, it could be mentally to grasp, difficult to beat, or anything else you can think. I guess we'll take. I'm assuming we'll, we'll talk about board games here. Well, sure. I mean, it, it really depends on what you call difficult, because there's a lot of games that you can you can really destroy your game very early on. I'm thinking of uh, most of the splatter titles, Food Chain Magnate. You can make a, an early move that just puts you out of the running entirely. Um, Age of Steam can do that. I was... I'm I'm in the middle of an online game of Dungeon Pets, and I totally didn't understand it. it it's been a long time since I had read the rules to that game and had never actually played it. And and I made a move very early on after getting a pet and totally. Well, I made it disappear into another dimension, and I didn't realize I was going to do that. Um, and I now I have no pets, and the game's called Dungeon Pets, and I can't get any more pets. Anyway, that's not what I was thinking of, though. I'm thinking of a game where you just get very overwhelmed by all of the choices very early on in the game. Um, something like A Feast for Odin, I have felt that way, that overload. What the heck am I going to do? Or, or Carnegie, um, where you're just faced with a whole menu of possibilities right at the beginning of the game. And, uh, what, why? I think Is those, even out to yet? me, are the most difficult games. Uh, which game? Carnegie? Carnegie's not out yet, is it? Earlier editions, I think, came out, and there's there's a, an online game on Board Game Arena that you can play it. <laughs> Eric is cool. Um, Thank you. I'm going to keep that one. I'm going to assume you're not talking about cooperative games, because that's a very diff different story here. We could talk sure, about the, yeah, the yeah. top 10. That could be a top 10 list, the top 10 most difficult cooperative games. Um, yep. For me, the hardest game for me to play is uh go actually mm. and it's and it's not even that it's it's not rules heavy because rules heavy games i can sit there and i can be like this is a slog ah uh, yeah you know but yeah, i yeah. will eventually get them go has only a few rules but it i find it to be just so overwhelming a guy will put a stone in the board and be like 
yeah. And I'll be like, I, what did you do? I don't know what the difference between putting the yeah, stone there was and anywhere else on the board. <laughs> yeah, in, I in would Korea, freak they out. Had a, they had a channel, you know, uh, about Go, and they would put stones in a board, and they'd be like, flip, 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 flip. And I, I, I don't know anything that just happened. It was, I, I just find that that's my personal overwhelming game. Um, hmm. Just to be clear, because this sort of thing happens, I'm not asking for anyone to explain and teach me Go at a future convention. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm okay being overwhelmed. <laughs> Matt from Chicago uh, mentions that we were talking about how Board Game Geek is uh, expanding its credits for games. More categories listed under a game for, for development. Uh, in this, we mentioned the designer, the artist, the developer. And Matt wants to know, what's the difference between a designer and a developer? Because I feel those jobs do much the same thing. They, they do not. That's true. Um, a designer designs a game. Think of them as the original author. Think of, it, think of it, the analogy is this. The designer is the author of a game. The developer is a hands-on editor. Yeah. Not, not yeah. an editor who just fixes grammar, but an editor who might say, you should rewrite this paragraph because it would sound better from this person's voice. You know, whatever that might be. Um, a developer can take a game and make it better. Uh, let's say we were just talking about this today. There's, there's a few people I think are amazing developers. I think possibly, and I might be wrong on this, possibly the best developer in the business is Rob Davio. Hmm. And that's why his position at Restoration Games is so fantastic. He takes older games. These games were designed by somebody else, and he rebuilds them from the ground up. Now, he does more development work on those than most people do. Yeah. But the original ideas, like, for example, what's the racing game called? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Downforce? Downforce. Downforce is not his game. It's, it's Wolfgang Kramer's original game. But he developed it and made it into the just excellent version that it was. He right. took Star Wars Epic Duels and developed that into um, Unmatched. And, you know, he took Fireball Island, a simple kids game, and developed it into a full-fledged game. Right. Now, now that's that's like extreme development. But there are developers that say we'll play a game, and it was like, ooh, you could, should do this, do this. The problem with developers is we'll never know for sure how much they've done. They don't right. get the credit and the glory, and I don't know that they should. Yeah. Um, but it is, in the industry, it's good to know who they are. I mean, I've heard many things about different games i know for sure that dominion was a different game before the developers got a hold of it mm. yeah yeah developers helped uh claus toiber cut Catan from a humongous game down into it what it, it is now yeah wasn't ent decker part of the original Catan? uh i don't remember if it's ent decker i think i think you might be right it was like a three games that came out of the original game right I think that's the story I heard anyway. Hey, Future Eric here, wanting to provide a little bit of context to that. Uh, it didn't quite sound right what I was saying there uh, on the on the show. So the three brothers that uh, that we were referring to are the Settlers of Catan, Ent Decker, yes, and Lowenhertz. Uh, that's those are the thir the three games that sort of came from the same idea. I found an old blog post from Klaus Teuber from like 2002 where he talks about, especially with uh, Ent Decker and Catan, and how they were originally the same game, but then he split it off. It wasn't necessarily a development thing where they got split off. And I guess uh, Lowenhertz was also part of that initial uh, game that then he you know split off the ideas from that prototype, and they became those three individual games. Still, cool story. I don't know how much of that was development and how much was Teuber. But still, information. Back to past Tom and Eric. Uh, another question from Matt. Uh, if you were designing or developing a game, at what point do you bring in the artist? At the beginning to help influence decisions or at the very end after the game is pretty much finished? Never. Never? <laughs> You're the designer. You're not the publisher. It's the publisher's job to get the artwork. Now, right. or, you yeah, may have... The you, developer. You may have input. You may have input on that. You know, I don't know. Um, or even a developer, yeah. The, at what point do you bring the artwork in? I don't know. I would bring in the artwork after the game's been pretty much designed. I, 
I'm sure artwork has influenced how a game has been designed in the past, but I would not plan on that. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say the artwork. I know some games have been inspired by artwork. I, I think Scythe is one of those. Sure. Um, but but I I think you want to because art is expensive. You don't want to have to redo art very much. So you'd like the game to be closer to finished, uh, so that you're not say eliminating a mechanism that somebody just spent a lot of time designing art for. Um, so I, I think it is closer to the end, but I think they, you know, because art takes time, they probably bring in the artist uh, sooner rather than later so that you can finish it along with the rest of the production process. All right. Our next questions are from Colin. He says, when we go through a top 10 in the podcast, one of you will name a game and the other will respond that it was his number 11. Is mm-hmm. that game literally the 11th choice? The just missed official cut? Or are you usually saying it as a general statement that you agree with your co-host? Just not enough for the game in question have made your list. And then he says, when you create your top 10s, how many slots do you fill? Do you do 10? Or do you include backup games that in slots 11, 12, 13? Hmm. Uh, well, well, for one thing, uh, when we say that it's our number 11, that is absolutely the truth. Um, no variation whatsoever. Uh, it is always the 11th game on the list. No, I mean, it is. That is sort of a... It's, it's our way of saying that almost made the cut. Um, and it may be 12 or 13, but it was very close to being in the top 10, which is where I'll, I'll say. It's weird. I, I, I mean, I sometimes I really do mean it was 11. A lot of, yeah. actually, a lot of times I mean that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, sometimes, well, because the way that I make my list is I'll make a list of anything that I feel is eligible for the list, and then I will narrow those down. Uh, into, I'll just start circling title. This has to be on the list. Oh, I really want this on the list. And then count, see what I've got. Um, And usually I'll have maybe seven or eight games and I need to find two more. Or I've got 11 or 12 games and I have to figure out which ones to eliminate. Um, And and that's where, when that happens, then I absolutely know that that game was number 11 because it was the last one I took off the list. Um, Or if I'm faced with two slots and three possibilities for it, then I, yeah, I know that number 11 was the one that didn't make the cut. Um, so usually I know, if not formal, what whether it's 11, 12, 13, etc., but I know that a few were just on the cusp. And so saying that something's 11 is not that far off accurate for me. Yeah, I don't usually make, actually I shouldn't say, the only time I do it is each year when I make my top 100, I... I will go all the way up to 300 in actual numbers. Wow. Um, just because I find that amusing for myself. But for each top 10, as soon as I have the number 10, I'm done. I, I have those other games on that scratch piece of paper. I do, exa- I do the exact same thing Eric does. I write them all down, circle the ones that will make it, add a few, subtract a few, done. You know, then yeah. take those, the 10 that I have left and number those. Sometimes I'll, I'll write the list down and I put number one next to, the, to me, the very obvious choice. Um, but yeah, I don't I'll then sometimes keep start counting with the out first past few 10. Or the last, yeah. yeah, yeah. Except for oh, I'm sorry. At the end of the year, I always go to tw- I always go to twenty for my for myself personally. Okay. Sebastian says there were and are a lot of downsides to the world crisis, but the silver lining, at least for me, is that I've played more board games than ever since the crisis started. We do weekly online sessions where normally it would take about a month to get the crew together. And playing board games online has its issues, from server issues to numerous bugs and online board games, but we also found a lot of upsides, more specifically the way games help you along a more streamlined game. For example, in Ticket to Ride, showing the cities you need to travel from and to, or in Terraforming Mars, show you your available moves, where you can place your cities, etc. Same goes for games like Istanbul, Scythe, and even Waterdeep. We even mused that when we play in real life board games again, we'll take our laptops to one location and keep playing online. I've heard of this actually happening. I don't remember it was a listener or whether somebody on Twitter talked about it, but that has certainly happened. Um, Does that feeling resonate with you too? Are there games you used to play at the table but are now reluctant to because the online experience was far more streamlined? No. Hmm. No, the only exception to that might be Werewolf, but 
Look, online is great. I'm glad it exists. There might be some games I don't bring to the table that because I might just play them on my iPad. It's faster. Terraforming Mars comes to mind. But no, I love people. I want to be back with yeah, people. Yeah, I still uh, think I'm going to continue playing online games. Well, obviously, pretty we frequently. watched you do it when you were at my house. Everyone else is eating lunch, and Eric's playing 67 games. That it wasn't 67; it was 12. And um, yeah, everyone was still eating, and so I made my moves on Board Game Arena. That's only the polite thing to do. Everyone was waiting for me to make my moves. And so I'm not saying it wasn't polite. I'm just (laughs) I'm not even saying it's bad. I'm just saying you definitely like doing it. I do. Uh, Oh, last question from Sebastian. A year of working from home will probably change the way we work forever. Will a year of online board gaming change gameplay needs forever? Could it be that there will be a higher demand for games with smoother experiences? I don't understand that that question. Well, it's sort of like. Will will the um, the gaming tastes of in real life gaming be changed by the social situations that we have had to adopt over the past year and a half? I don't think so. Like he says, I'm not games, sure. games that take less prepping, less counting, less double checking rules. I mean, I I want that anyway. I don't think the coronavirus had anything to do with that, right? But but I, I but I can answer his, his question here. There are some trends because of coronavirus, definitely. Almost every game in existence now, for good or for ill, sometimes, most of the time it's good, but sometimes it's not, has a solo variant. Yeah, that's true. Um, um, I think party games have, have taken the possibility of playing their game over an online interface into account. Really? You know, it's, it's, that I disagree on. Like, maybe three did it. That's not a trend. I, I think we'll probably see more games that are able to be played online that way. Maybe. I don't know, Eric. I, That's just my, my feeling. I mean, there's already online games you can play online. I just don't see the... I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to change gaming much at all in that regard. Now, other things will change gaming in a way you don't expect, like logistics have changed and how games get here. And there's there's yeah. more online rule books on how to play games. And True. games come to Tabletopia and Board Game Arena faster now. Because that's where people are playtesting them. So you can play them there. But actual board game design, I haven't noticed anything so far other than the solo game thing. Okay. Mike says, during the podcast sometimes, could you please talk about the two different libraries? I know that you repeatedly talk about the wonder that's a Dice Tower library. However, it seems like you are referring to Dice Tower East library. What are the differences between Dice Tower East... And Dice Tower West Library. I've been to the last two Dice Tower West conventions. I believe that was still the Dice Tower East Library. But now there'll be a new library. Should I worry about that for next year's Dice Tower West? Should you worry about it? No, I think that's a very legit question. The okay. Dice Tower East Library is indeed fantastic. I try not to brag about myself ever, but I will brag about that library. And <laughs> I work on it every day, practically. In fact, today I upgraded three more games. All right. And the bands are in. The box bands are in, and we're box banding the entire library. Okay. Fantastic. Dice Tower West. Uh, oh, and and like Marvel United is now completely painted. Every single hero and villain. Ooh. All right. Dice Tower West is a different library. It is not as upgraded and as finely honed as mine. Um, it's if you go to Dice Tower East, every game is personally curated by myself whether i mean i doesn't mean i don't put in games i don't like because there are plenty of games in there that i despise in fact tomorrow i'll be upgrading diplomacy of all things um okay well hey i mean people want to play it i want them to play with good pieces but it's honed you're not going to find a game nobody's going to play in there well you might but not many of them dice tower west is not so carefully curated but it's twice if not three times as big. Wow. That's right, folks. I just came back from Dice Tower West looking at that library. I believe there are 6,000 games in it. There are games from all over the place. There are new, brand new classics just from Kickstarter that are landing in the library. And folks, I am sending copies of Dice Tower West all the time. I will also, at each convention, have a hot games area, period. I will bring the hot games no matter what. So don't worry about that. But there is the hot games are there, but also old games from your childhood, like really 
Like you might find this game is bonkers. I, I know that's in the Dice Tower. You'll see Fireball Island, both of them. Okay. The new one and the old one. Uh, Return to Dark Tower. Well, I guess Dark Tower is in the library. Return to Dark Tower is not out yet, but that will probably be in Dice Tower West Library. So it's, it has all that stuff. It has brand new good games. It has old trashy games like Alf the Board Game and Merchants <laughs> of Venus. Wait, um, what? It has every version of Cosmic Encounter. Wow. Yeah, so stuff like that. So, But, I mean, don't think it's it's not just a bunch of old games. Um, I want to say more about the library because there's a couple cool things we're going to do with it, but hopefully that will tell you. And believe me, I'm, I'm looking at the list of games in the Dice Tower West Library, and I'm like, you're missing this? We're putting it in. So don't worry about that. Okay. So Dice Tower East Library, in my opinion, is slightly better, but that's because I'm sitting on it every day curating it. Sure. But the Dice Tower West Library, we're trying to make that the biggest library at any gaming convention there is. It's a it's a Las Vegas sized library. It's a Las Vegas library. Yes. There you go. Uh, last for today is a question from Daniel. You are invited to the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon or to Ooh. your favorite talk show and host. You get to talk about one game each. What game do you choose? I'm thinking more about the game he's going to play with me on the show. I like that yeah. stuff he does. I want to play one of the party games with Jimmy. Um, I would probably choose Pandemic. I'm deleting that from the final podcast. Let me. Let, what? I would pick Pandemic. Oh, what a great <laughs> suggestion, Tom. <laughs> no, I was thinking about this. Like, I would probably take whatever game I was in the mood for at that point in time, like some hot, welcoming game that I thought people would like. Right? That's what I would. I would take. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. right now, I would take Pandemic. Sure. And I would say something like, just like they beat the pandemic in this game, we can do it in real life. I don't know. I would say something along that line. I would be very positive. I wouldn't do it in any negative way. Like, I, oh, we're all tired of this. Like, But in this game, we're beating it, and it's a fantastic yeah. game. It, right now, that's what I would choose. But maybe in another year, I might pick Ticket to Ride. I might pick Century Spice. I don't think I would pick Century Spice Road because I don't think that has that zing look to it. Yeah, I might, I might pick Splendor to show off with the chips. I don't know if I'd pick that one either. A party game, maybe? Code names? Yeah, that's a good one. Just one. Just Some, one would be good. Oh, that that just would be one, one would, to, to play with, with you're Jimmy. Right. Just, just one would be a great one to show off. Something yeah. that would get people excited and that they might just go buy right then and there. Yeah. So, Jimmy, you know, you know where to find us, right? Just give us a call. <laughs> Our next guest... Famous voice actor and co-host of the Dice Tower, Eric Summer. You know, we we joke, but I think there are uh, writers for Seth Meyers that are definitely board gamers because he has had jokes hidden in his his uh, closer looks and monologues about German board gaming, and they are spot on with some of the stuff he's talking about. So there are definitely gamers on that staff. So. Late late night, folks. If you're listening, you know what? We'll, we'll show up on any talk show. We on, will. That, I mean, I'll show up on a daytime talk show. Sure, the you View. <laughs> if you want us on, we'll be there. <laughs> Kelly and Ryan, we'll show up. Alrighty, let's get to the top ten. It's a dice tower top ten. The dice towers top ten list is brought to you by Game Nerds. At game n e r d z dot com. All right, gimmicks in games. So this is what's a gimmick, Tom? Oh, you know what? I was I was actually I had it prepared to to tell you. Oh. So the definition of a gimmick is a trick or device intended to attract attention, publicity, or business. In the Philippines, it also means a night out with friends. But I think uh, oh, that's not what we're doing. That's not the definition I used. The night out with friends <laughs> um it's definitely something in the game a mechanism or a device often a device yeah that's there to suck you in you look at that and go well that's cool yeah now that doesn't mean that the game is cool and i want to be clear for me while the yep. vast majority of my games i think are good the gimmick is what's attracting me and also i could have did a top 100 here 
Uh, yeah, pr- quite possibly. This was hard to narrow I'm looking down. At, I'm looking at Eric's list, and I'm like, I should have put five of those on my list. But yeah. I don't know what I would drop off then. So There you go. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, I love several of yours. I'm like, oh, that would have been a good choice. That would have been. I, I'm almost happier that we we don't have a ton of crossover on this one, and that's probably good. We can talk about more stuff. This is also not a. Uh, sometimes I feel very emphatic on my, on my uh, like this is a top ten. This is it. Yeah. Here, if you ask me to make this list tomorrow, it might be ten different games, and I wouldn't even be upset about that. Yeah. No. This is this is definitely a bunch of cool stuff list. All right, here we go. Number 10. We're going to kick things off with the single crossover. My number 10 shows up later on Tom's list, but that's fine because it hasn't arrived from Kickstarter yet. That's true. My number 10 is the Camel Cup, and in Camel Cup, so you could say that the, the camels being on top of each other and moving is the gimmick, which it might be, but the gimmick for me is the pyramid that you press a button and it drops a die out. Yeah, which was actually an annoying gimmick in the original Camel Cup, but yep. in the new version of Camel Cup from uh, Plan B Games, it's a plastic device which works really well. You put some dice in, you press a button, and you don't know what die is going to come out. So it it's a color die that comes out, and then that die rolls. It's really dumb, and I <laughs> really like it. <laughs> I don't know yep. what it is uh, about it. So the the pyramid and Camel Cup. Yes. I, I felt really bad the first time I played this game. Uh, it was somebody who just bought a copy at Gen Con and was like, hey, we're going to play my new game. And the, the thing was already bending. The cardboard tower was already bending and it, it was sort of broken by the time we were done playing with it. And that was sad. So I'm glad they've upgraded it. Number nine. My number nine is the letter wheel from Tapple, the party game where you're trying to name certain words, but you can only name one l- word with each letter of the alphabet in a particular round. So you're like slamming down these paddles that have the letters on them to sort of block off the letters. Uh, And then you hit a release button and they all reset. It's kind of cool. It's neat. Tapple, the letter wheel, my number nine. Yeah, I like it. My number nine is the sleeves, the sleeved cards in Mystic Veil. Ah. Now this, this, this is, this is the one I was a little iffy on in this list because this is precariously close to becoming a, just known mechanism. Mm. Although the designer of uh, Mystic Veil, vale, as this, he's pretty much the only designer who uses these cards in clear sleeves, clear cards and clear sleeves on top of each other. He all his games or a lot of his games do that. Right. So, but Mystic Veil vale is the one that introduced it, and I'm still tickled every time I put a card on top of another card. I'm like, hee 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 hee. <laughs> so I lined up the icons. Now I have many icons. I like it. So that's Mystic Veil. Vale. Number eight. My number eight is a bit of an older title at this point. Uh, it's Merchants of Amsterdam and it's Auction Timer. Merchants of Amsterdam uses um, a, a Dutch auction system. Uh, and so this plastic device with a big plunger on it, you, you dial it uh, to the high price that you're setting an auction item at. And then you start it and it goes tick, 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 tick. And the, the little uh, arrow goes down, 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 down until somebody says, I'll take it. And they slam their hand on this plunger and break it, which is what happens with the uh, auction timer in Merchants of Amsterdam. So whenever I play it with somebody who had this, they're like, you're not slamming the button. You're going to say, I'll take it, and then you press it gently. Okay? Okay. Anyway, the auction timer for Merchants of Amsterdam is quite the gimmick. Number eight. I kind of feel like my number eight is a crossover. So I, gonna, I will agree. I will agree. I'm, I'm going to pretend it's a crossover. Okay. And we'll talk about it later on in Eric's list. I, I will allow it. Number seven. Number seven is from a game called Keeper, one of the key series games from Richard I definitely Creed. considered this one. Um, the, I'm, I don't know what they actually call it. I'm calling this the resource flip board. Uh, <laughs> what are these things called? <laughs> they're these, these cardboard grids, um, and but they're hinged in various ways, in multiple ways. And so you're flipping various panels back and forth. They're double-sided. And in order to you get the resources and actions available to you on the things that are visible when you have placed them down on the table. So you're flipping it around and trying to get, and you can never get all the things you want to be able to. To do, um, but that is the resource flip board from Keeper, my number seven. Yeah, I love that. I wish it was better used, but I do love it. I love that in games. If it's if it's like in two. So <laughs> a similar game that does this is Smartphone Inc. So not quite the same mechanism, but that same st- style of you know rotating your pieces around to try and get the action 
things you want. Yeah. That's 7A. My number seven is the tools and devices in Treasure Island. Treasure Island is a deduction game where one person is Long John Silver. Everyone else is trying to find them. And you're using a compass, like a literal compass and other navigational tools to slowly pinpoint on the island where Long John Silver is. It's not Hmm. super precise. It's not as good as other deduction games in that regard, but it's so thematic and fun. And I'm like, look, remember when you used to do this and you just made 65 circles on your paper in school when you got the compass? (laughs) Other than stabbing people with it. Um, Can you believe we were allowed to have those in school? (laughs) There's very sharp edges on a compass. Well, you could just stab someone with it. It's like a pointer thing. It's like it's like carrying a shiv with you. Yeah, I, I had um, one that I was was impaled on a, a block of foam. We had to leave it on the foam unless we were using it. When you were a kid, you had to leave it on foam. Wow. We we got some really nice ones in fourth grade, and and so yeah, they had quite the spikes on them, and so we we kept them on on foam pieces. I like to be clear, folks. I never stabbed one someone with one. I did stab myself, but that's a different story. Anyway, it it's in Treasure piece. Island. It's my number seven. Number six. Most of the items on my list are for some sort of physical gimmick. This is a mechanical gimmick, a mechanism in a game. That is the self-teaching deck from the the Fable games from Freedom and Freeze. One of my favorites is Flea, uh, a cooperative one, but Fortress is one of these. Fortune is another. You don't have a rule book in the game. You simply put the deck on the table and start flipping cards. All the instructions are either on the backs of the cards or on the cards you discover, and it teaches you as you go. Um, and you, you'll play multiple rounds, and, and everybody has learned the game. And I think it's a really cool design concept and a neat gimmick for, for teaching these small box card games. The self-teaching deck from Flea, Fortress, and many other Freedom and Freeze games. Number six. I do like this a lot. All right, my number six is one of the most talked about gimmicks when it was first announced to the point where... We don't talk about the gimmick as much now in the game, but before it came out, it was like the thing. And that's the Gears in Zulkin. Mm. I remember when that first was shown off, I, my mind was like, what? Gears that turn and turn other gears. Now, it turned out to be not as amazing. And in fact, Zulkin is a fine, fine game. Yep. And the Gears is actually used quite well. It's Once you play it, you're like, that's not really a gimmick, <laughs> I guess. But it does draw you in. The first time yes. you see Zulkin, you're like, what is this? Let me sit down and see this. Do You, you get to spin this, right? Well, yes, but very slowly. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I love yeah. I love it. I think it's clearly a gimmick. So Zulkin, my number yeah. six. I mean, th- there's certainly other timing issues that the central gear does, but you could have just as easily, I think, moved everything down one. <laughs> you could manually right. have moved stuff. Um, but it does make sure everything is synced. Uh, in in a way that that would have been difficult without those gears. They are very cool. Number five. My number five is an old school classic. It is the Popomatic Bubble from the game Trouble. It uh, the Popomatic was used in other games as well, but Trouble's really the only one that that really landed. Uh, it's it's a simple little bubble encased die <laughs> D six, uh, and you you push down on it and it pops and the die rolls. Um, it it means that the die doesn't get lost. The die is always with the game, um, and it it is pretty good at randomizing, I think. Uh, I, at least I haven't really had issues with any copies of Trouble I've encountered, and it's just fun to do. It makes a cool noise, and you can just, I want to pop the bubble. Um, good times with the pop bubble from Trouble, number five. I do love that pop bubble. All right, my number five, the whole game is a gimmick. Sure. And that's Drop Mix. Yeah, so if this you don't is know what choice. Drop Mix is, it's a big musical making machine that it hooks up to your phone or some electronic device and plays songs through it based on cards. You drop these cards in different locations and you drop a beat. And the songs are a very eclectic mix. They have everything. Yes. I mean, they got, um, oh, what do they have? Uh, they have Casey and the Sunshine Band. They got the Transformers theme. That was they a promo. Have, Sure, but I mean, at this point, the, the whole game's hard to get, so I don't yeah. care what you yeah, have fun trying to get it. But it's definitely a gimmick, and the game is nothing to write home about. It's like an Uno variant almost. But mm. the gimmick brought me in and kept me messing with it for a really long time. Drop mix. 
I do have the slightest bit of regret. There was a period, there was a window when, because originally this was like a hundred dollar game, and there was a window where they were getting liquidated, and I could have grabbed it, and I didn't. Um, and I, I do sort of regret not being able to play with Drop Mix because it's quite the gimmick. Number four. Number four is uh, is sort of a variant of a very popular gimmick, the Dice Tower, but this is a cube tower from Wallenstein. Uh, where you will throw units uh, represented by these cubes into this tower, uh, but it has slats that sort of block the cubes. And so the cubes will get stuck inside this tower. And whenever you have a battle in Wallenstein, you throw in the new cubes, and out might come some of those cubes, but also other ones that are hiding in the tower and have been for several turns. And so you never quite know what's going to show up out of the cube tower when you play Wallenstein. It's my number four. Yeah, I... I almost put this on my list too. Um, here's the thing. I, I think Cube Tower is closer to an actual really good thing over to gimmick. I don't even know anymore. I just, whatever. It's on Eric's list. Great choice, Eric. If only there was a modern variant to it though. Mm, maybe. Okay. So yeah, this is Eric doing a segue here. So my number four is Return to Dark Tower, um, which has this amazing tower. So many of you have probably played Dark Tower as a kid or at least saw it with this electronic tower going crazy so this tower has been redone into a i'm gonna say monstrosity but i don't mean that in a negative way but it's definitely gigantic it dominates the table it does it hooks up to an app and it spins around drops skulls out it lights up oh it's 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 crazy cool it's definitely a gimmick you know the box for for uh return to dark tower would be quite a bit smaller without it um, <laughs> yes. so yeah, that's, that's what brings you in the cooperative game and the des- developmental skills of Rob Davio, as mentioned earlier, will probably keep you in, but it's the tower that draws you. And Return to Dark Tower was my number 10. I left it so far back on the list because we haven't seen the final version yet. So although I've got to play a prototype game uh, at PAX a, a while ago, I haven't seen where it's going to end up. But the, uh, the you throw skulls into the tower and it has slats and baffles and stuff. And, and those skulls can bounce back out at various points in the game uh, and, and cause nasty stuff to happen to your villages. So it's very similar in some ways to that cube tower from Wallenstein. So I was not totally wrong with the segue. Number three. My number three is from Forbidden Sky. It is the rocket. The object of the game in Forbidden Sky is to connect with these actual electrical pathways uh, a circuit from one end of the rocket through various cards and structures around the board to the other end of the rocket. And if you do that successfully, you've completed the circuit and the rocket will actually light up and make a blast off sound. It's it's one of the best dramatic finales to a, a game that, that you get in a board game. It's pretty cool uh, when you actually get it to work and a, a nice reward for completing Forbidden Sky. It's my number three, the rocket. This is the only one I'm disagreeing with Eric on, and it's only because it doesn't work as well as it should. Really? It doesn't. The, the, the gears don't always line up as nicely as they should. The game was also terrible, but that's so much trouble. So I'm not, I'm not holding that against <laughs> it being on the list. Um, I don't know. I, I thought this, this sounded so cool in theory, and it didn't work as well as I wanted it to. Okay. It's never, it's never failed for me, so... I swear this episode is not sponsored by Restoration Games, but here we have (laughs) Fireball Island. No, are you talking about Volcar or the island itself is the gimmick? Volcar is the gimmick, baby. Although the island is, it's it's, it's all the same, right? Right. Volcar dropping a marble in the top and having it roll down the chute. And you know what? This was the gimmick of the original Fireball Island. As a kid, when I first saw this, I had to play it. Like, I had to... I mean, if you watch the YouTube channel, you know I'm a big fan of marble racing. And <laughs> I had to have a game that marbles went rolling down a board. That was phenomenal. When I finally played it, I was like, oh, it's not that great of a game. <laughs> I like the new version much better. And it also does things like lets you, you know, flick marbles and do all kinds of things. But nothing beats Volcar. Yeah. Putting a marble in Volcar and seeing it come down the board. <laughs> Fireball Island, my number three. Number two. Poseidon's Kingdom is my number two because I forgot of, this one. 
I would the have said it. Dice Wave. The Dice Wave is a large cardboard structure that you build and you place dice onto specific spots and you will then tip the thing over and those dice will cascade off the top and spread across the board and then you will play the round based on the zones that the dice end up in and the values that they they roll to. Um, it is it is quite the structure uh, and, and a very dramatic beginning to each round of Poseidon's Kingdom. That's why it's my number two. Ah, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a great one. Good, good choice. Good choice. My number two is the rocket ship from Starfarers of Catan. The rocket ship serves two purposes. You are adding rings, guns, and engines to it to show how fast your rockets on the board can move. And you turn it upside down and shake it to drop little marbles, little plastic balls to see how far you can move and if you have a random event. Now, this mm. is not the only game that does this, turn something upside down, let little marbles come out. Um, the, uh, was it Masquerade? What was that game called? Um, I think that's what, uh, Incognito. Incognito, yeah. Incognito had the, uh, a very strange creature, um, a masked man who did the same thing. Uh, I, I don't know why I like that so much. I just do. <laughs> so, Starfarers of Catan, my number two. And finally, number one. My number one, and what Tom is going to call the crossover of his number eight, is the Ingredient Hopper from Potion Explosion. Uh, a marble hopper with six, 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 six uh, troughs. Six? Um, that, that you, are, uh, you, you dump the ingredients up in the top and they sort of cascade down and percolate into the rows that you will then remove marbles from and then those cascade down and cause explosions. Like the whole mechanism of the game revolves around this hopper. Um, and they've improved it over the years. There's now a plastic version of the hopper. It used to be cardboard. Um, but it really just fuels the whole game uh, and, and works quite well. Tom had the slight variant for his number eight, but my number one was Potion Explosion and the Ingredient Hopper. Yeah, actually, I think the Ingredient Hopper and Potion Explosion is cooler than the one I was talking about in Gizmos, where there's one marble row. I mean, you got to say yeah. sixes. But see, the Gizmos, it's better randomization. Potion Explosion, I think so. you, you it's, are it's the like randomizer. It's like almost a gumball machine. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I like both of them. They're both fun. Again, Plus, uh, in Gizmos, you can... You, you sometimes are drawing from the inside the hopper like blindly, or you can choose from the six that are available for you to actually pick one out. So mechanically, they work a little bit differently. They're both very cool. All right. I believe my number one is a definitive uh, gimmick in a game. Yeah, I because considered if you it. Take this, if you take this gimmick out of the game, there is no you game. You have nothing. <laughs> and in fact, no one even plays the game. They just play the gimmick. And that is Mousetrap. My, my kids play play the actual game. Do they? They do. I, they, I, they, they played it at Dice Tower Con and said, we need to get a copy of this. And ever since, they've played the actual game. That is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I love, don't get me wrong. I love Mousetrap and putting that together. It's just a game. I was like, meh. But I love building that thing together. You know what? My son would love this game. Maybe I should get Mousetrap. I wonder if it's, uh, yeah. like, is it still sold? I mean, it's got oh, yeah. to be sold, right? Oh, yeah. You can still get it. I, th I don't think the design is the same. I think no, they've, they've I think... tweaked it over the years. I just did a search for Mousetrap, and, I'm, and uh, I, I need to put Mousetrap game. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You're going to get different stuff. Oh, this looks, this looks cheaper and not as good. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I think it, it probably works better. Who knows? It's hard to say whether they've, you know, refined it so that it works more reliably or if they've just given up and they're making it out of cheaper plastic now. Well, they're definitely making it out of cheaper plastic. Come on, we're talking about Hasbro here. Uh... The edition that I got maybe uh, five, six years ago um, has worked pretty well. So This actually looks the exact same. But then again, I see two different versions of it. Let me click on the other yeah. version and see what the differences look like. Oh, there's no. They've man. kept the iconic elements. So there's, uh, I think there's always a man in the rub a dub tub, and there's always a boot kicking something, um, and the 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 zigzag down the ramp. Oh yeah, this one has a slight difference in it. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. All right, yeah, yeah. Um, let's go to people's choice here. Don't forget, folks, you can go to our website and always vote on the next people's choice. Uh, people's choice number twenty, Treasure Island. 
Number 19, Mystic Veil. Number 18, Crossbows and Catapults. Good choice. Well, sure. But again, without that gimmick, there'd be nothing. Number 17, Cash and Guns. Uh, Yeah, foam guns are definitely a gimmick. 16, Escape, The Curse of the Temple. I would say the The gimmick The soundtrack is is the the gimmick. Yes, 10 minutes. 15, Nidavellir. I guess it's a gimmick. gimmick? Well, you're playing coins and I don't know. Uh, Okay. Number 14, Risk Legacy. Tearing up stuff. That was the gimmick. 13, Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. Uh, Plastic Pieces. Before that was cool. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Twelve. The, the, mi- tower. the mind. No I guess talking. The mind's gimmick is no talking. Eleven. Colt Express. The, the train. massive train in it. Yep. Ten. Return to Dark Tower. Nine. Starfares of Catan. Eight. Shogun. That has the cube tower that the Eric mentioned tower. for Wallenstein. Yeah. Seven. Chronicles of Crime. I guess. QR codes. QR codes is the gimmick. Six. Wingspan. Is Wingspan just put into games at this point? Do people just vote for Wingspan no matter what? What's the gimmick? Is it the 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 um, the birdhouse dice tower? The I eggs? Yes, I, I seriously think some people just vote for Wingspan every time. I'm All gonna right. uh, wrong. Okay, number five, <laughs> mouse trap. Number four, Gizmo. Number three, just ever- one. Gizmo. Sorry. Well, I okay, fine. Gizmo. Uh, number three, Everdell. The tree. Yep, I yeah. considered that. Number two, Fireball Island, and number one, Zulkin. Those gears. All right, man. I, I like to. I mean, like I said, I could. I could talk about gimmicks and games all day long. And I just gimmicks seem to really irritate some people. You know, it's like, usually oh, used as a, a pejorative, but yes, a gimmick can really draw you in. It gimmicks work on me. They definitely do. If you're like, this game has magnetic stuff. I'm like, it does. Show <laughs> me more. I mean, this board talks. It knows where your fingers are touching it. What? Yeah, you're definitely a sucker for gimmicks too. We 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 I definitely am. cross over in this regard. <laughs> well, you, do you remember what was the the Reiner Knizia game that that the board knew where you were touching it? Ah, uh, it was like a King Arthur game. King right Arthur, except it didn't work right, and people had to lick their fingers to make it work. And it's like, okay, we haven't really seen that again. Anyway. Oh. Alrighty, folks. Well, there you go. That's another episode of the Dice Tower. Thanks so much for hanging around. As always, I hope you all have a fantastic day. Come back and listen to our next episode. But until then, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summer. And you've been listening to the Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode number 720 was recorded on July 22nd, 2021. Mandy and Suzanne take the controls for next week's episode, and in two weeks, Tom and I will be breaking down our top 10 city games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassell Memorial Fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need. If a catastrophic event has become more than you can handle, find out how we can help at jackvassell.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Mandy, Suzanne, and Eric, with assistance from Rob Searing, Chris Yee, Mike Delicio, and Roy Kennedy. Pubs that are welcoming to all mouth parts are brought to you by Taverns of Teeth and All. Timothy Pinkham composed our theme, and hosting is provided by Game Nerds, your all-in-one solution for all your nerdy needs at GameNerdsWithAZ.com. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Tom at DiceTower.com or Eric at DiceTower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network, including Board Game Blitz, the Portal Gaming Podcast, the Family Gamers, Board Gamers Anonymous, the Broken Meeple, the Game Pit, and Dice Tower Tonight. Find your next favorite at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, Tom, existential question. Uh, Are the top ten lists our gimmick? Are we recording? (laughs) Uh, We are recording. No. Not a gimmick at all. Eric is cool.